Today I've got a special treat for you. Pastor Donald Schott is here, going to bring forth the word. Would you give him a warm Journey Church welcome? Thank you, bro. How are you guys doing today? Did you get any sleep? <laughs> All right. Well, man, I'm so excited to continue in our epic series today. And if you're new to Journey Church, we have been going through this series uh, starting at the beginning of the Bible at the beginning of the year. Um, that's what we do here. We teach the Bible. Amen. So we uh, talking about the story of God and uh, since the beginning of the year. And, and, and now we are transitioning. We find ourselves in Leviticus 20. Three And sometimes when you just throw that name Leviticus out there, that book, you're like, oh, man, here we go. This is a deep book, and it actually is. So, um, man, this is where we see God beginning to lay down uh, the festival and the sacrificial system of God. And, you know, we've already seen him. He's already handed down the Ten Commandments to Moses, and now we're transitioning on. And so if you're like me, maybe you've wondered, you know, why all these strange laws? Have y'all ever read any of the laws at all in the Old Testament? Raise your hand. Anybody? Come on. All right. Yeah, some of you have. So you know what I'm saying, man. There's some difficult stuff, just some crazy laws in there that we just, we have a hard time wrapping our mind around. But, uh, man, I remember back when I had just been saved, and I wasn't raised in church, okay? I, I, I didn't have the benefit like some of your children have, or maybe you have, of uh, being raised in children's church. And so you know the story of creation and Noah and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. You, you've heard of all them. But see, I wasn't raised in church, man, all that stuff. I, I didn't really, I've heard these things before, but none of it really made any kind of sense to me. So after I got saved a little while, uh, I think my wife was giving me a little time to kind of get adjusted, you know, from being such a heathen in the world to coming into the church and everything's just so brand new. So she finally sprung this on me. She asked me if I would go to a Sunday school class fellowship with her. And being unchurched, I didn't even know what the heck a fellowship was. That was just some weird, you know, foreign word to me. I, I had no clue. And you, you couldn't Google it back then, you know. So, hey, I was just hung out to dry on this one. I didn't know what I was getting myself in. But, hey, I figured, you know what? My wife wants me to go. It's something to do with church in some form. Where I'm all in. So I went, you know, and it started out really great, man. I was eating some, you know, good food and having some good conversations, some fun. All of a sudden... <laughs> They break out this game called Bible trivia. Not good. <laughs> See, I already knew I was the dumbest one in the room about the Bible. <laughs> we didn't need any game to determine that reality, I, you know. I mean, hey, if they have broke out rock and roll trivia, I'd have smoked them all. <laughs> Wouldn't even been close, man. Wouldn't have been hanging my head in shame on that one. But, man, again... I didn't have the benefit of being raised in church. And, and so I didn't really know who did what. I didn't understand, you know, uh, who Noah was and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I didn't know, you know, as far as I knew, Abraham built the ark. Some of you are going like, you mean he didn't? <laughs> no, he didn't actually. But see, I didn't know these things, man. I, I, I just, uh, you know, the whole Bible trivia thing, it just really seriously messed me up that day. And so on the way home, my wife, of course, had to hear about that one. I said, well, I hope you enjoyed yourself because I won't be going back to no fellowship again. <laughs> Forget that nonsense. You ain't going to make a fool out of me again. But here's the deal, guys. Seriously, I, I transitioned from that stage in my walk in, in, with Christ, you know, as an as a infant in Christ and, and starting to crawl, you know, and starting to walk a little bit. And so when I started reading the Bible, I wanted to read through the Bible in a year because I just wanted to know more. I didn't want to get hung up in no fellowship again. So I started reading the Bible. And uh, when I got to Leviticus, I was going, man, you know, I, bet I was trying to read. It would be early in the morning. You know, I'm trying to read Leviticus and, and I just started falling asleep, you know, and it looked like a chicken pecking corn trying to read Leviticus, as truth be known. It was tough, man. I think some of you know what I understand, but for me, I didn't understand the point. I didn't understand the point in Leviticus. I, I just, you know, it was just tough again for me to stay awake. And I think it's like that for most people. You know, we get, we, we go through, you know, we start out in Genesis, and man, that's pretty exciting, that's pretty, and then we go into Exodus, God, this is awesome, man, the, you know, the God doing all these plagues and messing with Pharaoh, and all of a sudden he just leads the, the Israelites out of, and it's all excited, but then you get into, you know, Leviticus, and things start to go, oh my gosh, I, I don't really understand what's going on here, so there's really 
no way I could adequately cover Leviticus 23 in our time today. I have a very good friend of ours that actually wrote a book on Leviticus, just, just Leviticus 23. It took him over a year and a half. So there's no way I'm going to, uh, you know, cover it all. But what I did, I wanted to look at the principles found in Leviticus 23 today. Because, man, there's some rich stuff involved in what's going on here. So let me just start off our, our time today by just saying this. You guys, you will never understand the riches and the depth of God's love and his mercy for you until you understand the Old Testament and, the new, and all the laws in there. I'm telling you, man, because it, it, it all paved the way. It all was pointing. It was a shadow of what was to come when Jesus would come one. So hopefully you've been following along in our weekly Bible reading in Leviticus 23. And so, again, this is where God is continuing to lay down his law. And so... You know, basically, there's three types of, of law. First of all, there's the moral law. Those are like the Ten Commandments. We, we've all heard those, right? And there, was, there were some others, okay? And then there was what is known as the ceremonial law. That's where we're at today. We're going to be talking about the ceremonial or the sacrificial system. It kind of encompasses all in the ceremonial law. And then they had another part, was this same thing we have today, is the civil law. You know, people need to be kept in check just like they do today so they don't go out there and do a bunch of jacked up stuff. So they actually had a civil law. But, man, there were 613 commandments for crying out loud. How is a guy supposed to keep up with that? I mean, there were some um, could-dos, a lot of could-dos. But then there were some don't-you-dare-do because it would have cost you your life to violate these things. So there were some really strange laws. Uh, if you, you want to have some fun, just go online and download uh, 613 commandments of the Old Testament. You can have some fun reading some of them, because there were some really weird, weird, strange laws there. Like you couldn't eat bugs with wings. <laughs> hey, apparently, there were some people eating bugs with wings back then, and God's going, no, no, that's just messed up. We're going to put a stop with that one, you know. But here's the thing. You, you could eat locusts. It, as long as they had a certain stripe or a certain marking on them, you could eat locusts. So those, uh, those were permissible to chow down or maybe crunch down on. I'm not really sure. I've never eaten locusts before and don't really want to try. But then there were some other commandments that were, you know, that just really made perfect sense to us. Like, do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not commit fornication. Don't lie. Don't steal. And then God says you need to work. You need to work. But then... Here's the most repeated law in the Old Testament. I think it was the most important one. Obviously, God repeats this one commandment all throughout the Old Testament. He says, on the seventh day of every single week, you need to rest. I want you to rest. I don't want you doing anything. I just simply want you to rest, and I want you to reflect on my goodness, my mercy, I want you to reflect on how holy I am. And there was a very good point why he wanted his people to do that. So in Leviticus 23, we see God is beginning to hand these laws down to Moses and some additional laws known as the feast or the sacrificial system. And so the question again comes, well, why all the laws? Why 613 laws? Why all these strange laws? Well, here's the deal. The answer to that question is actually found also in Leviticus. It's found in Leviticus 23. 20 verses 22 to 26 let's check it out he says you shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my judgments and perform them that the land where I am bringing you to dwell may not vomit you out not, in other words staying in the land required obedience to God's word or else it, it, they wouldn't have been able to stay in the land that God was bringing them to verse 23 he says you shall not Walk in the statutes of the nation which I am casting out before you. For they commit all these things, and therefore I abhor them. I, am I saying that word right? Every time I say it, it just sounds funny. Baby, abhor, that's right, right? Is that right? Okay, I got it right. Okay, I don't know. It's just one of those words that's hard to pronounce me. I can't help it. But then he keeps on and goes to say in verse 24, he says, he goes, But I have said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has, what's that next word? Separated. Heads up on that word, okay? We're going to, be, we're going to talk about that word a lot. So he says, well, I have separated you from the people that you should therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean animals, between unclean birds and clean. And you shall not make for yourself abominable by beast or by bird or by 
any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated you from as unclean, and you shall be what? Holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy and have separated you from all the people that you should be mine. So the reason for the law is pretty clear. God just wanted his people to be separate. He didn't want them to look like the other nations. He didn't want to look, he, he wanted them to, to, to be like himself. He wanted to set them apart to be holy. He just simply wanted his people to be holy. That's all God was wanting to do here. So here's what I want you guys to see. In Leviticus 21, or 23, 1 through 2, the Lord spoke to Moses and saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, in other words, holy gatherings, holy assemblies, holy getting together here. These are my feasts. And so God starts out and he's reaffirming the one that he was the most important to him. He's reaffirming the Sabbath. And this is so important to see because the Sabbath was a serious deal. It, it, it wasn't going to be this kind of hit and miss cultural Christianity that we have today where sometimes we come or maybe we got something else to do or man you know what I'm just not gonna uh, or hey move the clock ahead and find out what happens we empty out for that see God wasn't gonna put up with that back then move the clock ahead God's going no, no I don't think so you keep the Sabbath holy it is a day that I don't want you to do anything but reflect on me look at Leviticus 23 3 he goes six days and here we go and he's already repeated this in the Ten Commandments, commandment number four. Remember that? He says, six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest. It's a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it for the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwelling. So God, in, he affirms right here what he's been saying all along, the importance of this one day every single week. He lays down his law, and so he's, he, as he's beginning to lay down these laws of feasts or the sacrificial system, he starts with this really cool feast called the Unle Feast of the Unleavened Bread. It's the very first one that you find in Leviticus 23. It's known as the Passover celebration. You remember the Passover? We've already talked about that, you know, where you know, if they wiped the blood of the lamb on the doorpost at, before they were exiling out of Egypt, and when the death angel passed by, if he saw that blood, that all the firstborn in that house would not die. And so that was one of the plagues. Remember that? Well, this is a celebration. This commemorates that Passover uh, feast of unleavened bread. And so the unleavened bread, really what it, what it was a picture of was their hurried departure from Egypt. Man, when it come time to hit the road, there was no time to grab a bunch of stuff. And so unleavened bread was something that you could make pretty quick back then. Was just basically flour and some salt and water, mix it up, you know, throw it on a hot stone. And hey, voila, you got something to eat on your road on the way out of Egypt. So this was associated also with hardships. That's what it represented. It represented the hurried departure and the hardships that they were under while they were in Egypt. So for seven days, check this out. Man, we eat anything twice in, 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 a, in, a, in a week, and we're sick of it, right? We're so spoiled. God says for seven days, seven days, the only thing you're going to eat is this unleavened bread. He goes, and while you're eating it, I want you to reflect on me. I want it to remind you of what I have delivered you from. Let it be a reminder of what you went through, the hardships. And so basically, this was pita bread. I kind of like pita bread myself, you know, I don't know about seven days, but yeah, you put some pita bread and some hummus in front of me, it's gone like popcorn. I, I, I just love that stuff. I could eat it, but not for seven days. That's a, that's a little much. But on the seventh day of this feast of unleavened bread, you guys know what happened? Nothing. It was the Sabbath. God says you ain't working. You're not cooking. If you're going to eat on the Sabbath, then you better fix it on the Friday, the day of preparation, because there's no work. I just want you guys to rest and reflect on who I am and what I've done for you. I want you to reflect on my holiness, how awesome I am. That was the whole point. God will say, when you get sick and tired of eating that pita bread, let it be a reminder of you of what happened in the past. In other words, don't dare forget what I have done for you. So many times we do that today. 
Is it not true? We, we do. We forget what God's done for us. I mean, that's just it. We forget to look back on what has God, to, you know, like when we go through a trial or some bad thing that happens, you know, and, we, and God gets us out of that and we get on the other side of it, we grow from it. But then when the next trial comes, what happens? We get so focused in on what we're going through and start having our little pity party that we forget, wait a second, if God did that, then he can do it again. He can, get, he can get me out of that. In fact, there's people that are not here right now today because they're going through a trial. And so they're so focused on what they're going through that they can't even bring themselves to worship the very God that can get them out of the trial. Amen? Well, Donald, are you saying that God causes bad things to happen to people? Um, I'm not sure, but what I do know is that God does allow it. Why? For the purpose of building our strength and our faith in God, building up endurance, building up patience with trust in God. James actually wrote a lot about that very subject. Let's check it out. James 1, verses 2 through 3. He goes, My brothers, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Patience. That word patience is better translated actually means endurance everybody's pretty much familiar with Mike Sereno and his story and what happened to him you know he's in that horrific accident and as he was going through that transition I mean the guy lost his leg and he's had more surgeries in just a short amount of time than most people will ever have in a lifetime and 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 so as he was transitioning out of the hospital and, and into a rehab, I went to see him one day, and it, it was just me and him. And it was just a sweet time, and, and uh, I, I asked Mike, I said, well, Mike, how you doing? And he started, you know, telling me all about the progression and uh, his surgeries. I go, that, that's not what I'm, I'm asking you. I'm asking, you know, how are you doing up here? How are you dealing with this? He goes, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked. He goes, here's the thing, Donald. He goes, you know my parents, you know, you know they're not saved. And Mike's parents had come down into town uh, to help them, uh, you know, go through this whole thing. And they're not churched, okay? So when we would show up to staff and, and other members of the church, man, we would basically have a church right there in the hospital in Mike's room. And we did, did we not? We were doing communion in there, man. We were, it was just awesome. And we were in there raising our hands. I think the doctors and nurses probably thought we were just nuts, you know, because we were just having church up in there, man. And uh, his parents were there, and they, they didn't get it. They didn't understand it, you know. And so Mike and I was having that conversation, and he said, you know what, Donald? My parents went back home. You know what happened? He goes, uh, they found a church. It, yeah. Go figure, right? Because we were planting seeds the whole time. And so Mike said, this is what Mike said, it's such a profound thing. He, he said, Donald, I got to be honest with you. He said, he goes, if nothing else, I've lost my leg. I, I, you know, I'll never be the same. But he said, you know what? If it will bring my parents to Christ, then it's all worth it. Amen. 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 Hey, Mike. Love you guys. I they're probably watching, so everybody say hello to Mike. Hey, Mike. <laughs> but the next commandment in, in line in, in Leviticus 23 was the Feast of the First Fruits. And this is really important stuff. It was, it was known as the barley harvest. They, were, they were, had the barley, but the, you know, it was ready, it was ripe, the harvest was ready. If anybody's ever grown anything, you know that first time, that first crop, that first bit, that's the best right there. So what do these guys do? Well, God lays down the law for the barley harvest. He says, on the, on, when the harvest is ripe, I want you to take a sheaf of barley. With, uh, and a sheaf wasn't an exact measurement. It was just a bundle of barley. They would take the very best they had. And they would wave it as a wave offering to the Lord. And they, what it was, they were just simply thankful that God had not only blessed them with this harvest, but it was also by faith in the, in the harvest to come the following year that God was going to still bless them then. They were giving God a portion back to what had belonged to God anyway. And they were just celebrating this thing through this harvest known as the Feast of First Fruit. Hey, it's the same principle today. We still do this today, not with barley, but it's the principle of tithing. This is why we do that. We just simply give God back a portion that he's already given back to us. And you know what? Some people will say, well, tithing's of the law. We're no longer under the law. We're under grace. And, you know, here's the thing. Tithing today is not about the Old Testament. 
I, I don't know where, you know, people get that from. See, tithing today is choosing, choosing. See, the law was ha- have to, got to, you better do. But over when we come over to the New Testament, tithing is I get to, I want to. Why? Because of what all God's done for me. I love God, so why would I not want to give him what he's blessed me with and just as a form of appreciation, just like they were doing, by not only by faith that God had provided right then for our necessities, but that God will continue to provide in the future for our necessities according to his will for us. Never confuse law, Old Testament law, with principle. That's what we sometimes try to do. See, when you fuse Old Testament law with principle, when you try to do that with it, you know what you get? Legalism. You get have to, got to, not want to. So we, never, we don't ever need to confuse with the principle. The standard in the New Testament is love. Paul said, you shall fulfill the law of Christ, which is love. So if we love God, we're going to give him A portion of our income. It's not a have to, but it's a want to. It's I want to give God the first fruits of what he's blessed with me. And so the next thing we have in line, this very, very similar feast, was the Feast of the Harvest. This is found in Leviticus 15 through 16. We don't have time to read all that. This is also known as the Day of Pentecost. We all are very familiar with that term, right? Well, this festival dedicated the very first fruits of the wheat harvest, okay? And so God instructed his people to count seven weeks and one day being 50 the word pentecost in the greek in the new testament means 50th this is very significant as we're getting ready to see so let me break that down for you because this feast was it was a whole lot more than just a celebration that lasted for seven weeks it was very prophetic time on the jewish calendar jesus christ rose from the grave on a sunday we're getting ready to celebrate that Seven weeks later and one day, and here's the thing. Okay, so Jesus Christ raises from the dead on a Sunday. Remember, he was seen by men for 40 days. Then he ascends. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit shows up on the scene on the 50th day. The Holy Spirit was the first fruits of the believer's inheritance. That's why this is so significant. And it's just amazing how prophetic this all lines up. And so the Holy Spirit was the first fruits of our inheritance. Let's check it out, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. It says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. That's how you get saved. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, right? And so it goes on to say, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Now, that's some good stuff. Y'all should be shouting up in here on that one, man. Give God a hand. Awesome. I don't care who you are. That's some good stuff right there. Well, the next in line, we have the Feast of the Trumpets, okay? And, and again, we don't have time to read it or discuss it. You can read about that in Leviticus 23, verses 23 through 25. Now, check this out. The Feast of the Trumpets was pretty cool. It was a very important day. During the Feast of the Trumpets, uh, what was going on was what is known as the 10 Days of Awe on the Jewish calendar. Now, the 10 Days of Awe was just a time when all the Jewish people did was take this 10 days and use it as a time to focus inwardly. It was a time of self, you know, examining their self to find, you know, to see, you know, what's in my life that's not pleasing to God. It was really a time of repentance. It was a time when they were looking inside and repenting of their sins this whole 10 days. And, you know, this idea of 10 days of awe, it's something we do today or should do. Actually, we should do it before we even come in this building in the morning. We should be repenting all known sin and coming in and preparing our hearts for worship before we ever even get in this building. I realize that's kind of hard to do. Sometimes we're fighting with the husband and the wife and getting the kids ready and all that. I get it. But what about when you wake up in the morning? Why don't you uh, start it right then before anybody else gets up? That's a great time to start doing it. But there's another time of this self-reflection that we're supposed to do that we see in the New Testament and Scripture. We have the communion elements over there on the right and left, and we do it corporately about four times a year. Did you know that's what you're supposed to do before you ever take communion? Did you know the Bible warns against just taking communion flippantly? 
without even understanding what you're doing and what you're getting ready to do. Did, did you know the Bible tells us not to take communion if you have some things going on in your life that's unrepented? So when we take communion, what we're supposed to be doing is kind of like what they were doing in the 10 days of awe. It's, in time, it's a time to look inwardly and repent of all known sin. In fact, Paul warns about this very thing about communion. Check it out. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 29. He goes, therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Here we go. Verse 28. This is what you're supposed to do. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. In other words, the Lord is holy. We're supposed to be holy. So before you take communion, you might want to check up on yourself because this is what this, again, this is the idea of this 10 days of awe. That's what they were doing back then. This is how we apply that principle to our everyday living today. So next in line is the Mac Daddy of them all, man, the Day of Atonement. This is the big one, and I don't have time to go through all those today, but I did not want to gloss over the Day of Atonement today. You can read about it in Leviticus 23, 26 to 28. Wow. I mean, what a huge, massive, important day this was on the Jewish calendar. It's the annual day of Yom Kippur. We've all heard of that, right? So this was the time when, they would, when Aaron, the high priest, would offer up a an offering for his own sin. You, you might be thinking, well, he's a high priest. You mean he was sinful? Yeah, we're all born sinners. He was no different just because he was the high priest. So Aaron would have to go through this ritual of first cleansing himself, and then he would put on a tunic, a white tunic, just specifically as God had said he needed to put this on. Everything had to be done to the letter or would not have been success or, or acceptable to God. So Aaron would do all these things, and then he would offer up a bull, a young bull, as a sin sacrifice for himself, and then he would also offer up a ram for a burnt offering for himself. He had to do this to the letter before he ever dared step into the holy of the holies of the temple. I want you guys to see this in Scripture. Check it out. Leviticus 16, 2. He said, and the Lord said to Moses, remember Aaron is Moses' brother, right? This is how serious this was. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, do not come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. God was saying, tell your brother Aaron, if he messes it up, I'll kill him. You mean God would have killed the high priest? And it, God's no respecter of persons. We need to understand that. God commands us to be holy. Aaron wasn't any different. He says, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Man, we got to wrap our heads around that one. Again, I don't want to gloss over the day of the atonement. It's so important. So after Aaron had completed, um, you know, washing himself, putting on this tunic and sacrificing these animals for his own sin, they would then grab two goats, perfect goats, but no, no, you know, yard goat or anything. These are goats without blemish. It was really important. They would get two goats. They would take them to the t uh, tabernacle. Then they would cast lots. And lots were kind of like, I don't know, rocks and sticks and stuff, you know, with certain symbols written on them. And they would cast them. And they, they believed that, that the high priest cast the lots, but the Lord determined where they fell. And so there was a given area where they would cast these lots in. And wherever they fell would depend on which one of these goats they would choose for the Lord to sacrifice for the whole entire nation of Israel's sins. The other goat was called the scapegoat. We've all heard of that, right? So after they would sacrifice the one goat for the Lord, then Aaron would take that one goat and he would place his hands on that goat. It was symbolic in nature. Okay, I want you to understand that. Remember Isaiah 53, 6, somewhere around in there? When God foretold, for he has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's what God the Father did to God the Son. That's what was going on here. So Aaron symbolically places his hand on the goat, okay? It was a picture of laying on the sins of the nation of Israel, laying on the goat the iniquity of the whole nation of Israel. And then they would turn the goat loose to run away in the wilderness. It was to signify the taking away of the sins of the nation of Israel, that's what your Savior did when he died on the cross. He took our sins away. 
But here's the big difference between the Day of Atonement and when Jesus Christ died on the cross. The Day of Atonement was a temporary appeasement for sin. All of those sacrifices in the Old Testament for sin, they were all just an appeasement for sin, okay? It wasn't a once and for all time forgiveness. They had to repeat this at all different points in time of the year. The Day of Atonement was once a year on the seventh month. Every single year they had to do this for the appeasement that God would accept temporarily for their sins. That's why it's so important to understand the Old Testament. Because this paved the way for the Savior to come. That will one day die on the cross for all of mankind. Who for whoever by faith would put their trust in Jesus Christ. But these blood of bulls and goats, it was never completely acceptable to God. Never. How do we know that? Let's look at Hebrews 10, 4 through 10. It tells us, For it was not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when he came, Jesus, into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. This is when God the Father says to God the Son, you're going down there in the form of a man, you're going to die on the cross. That's what he means by a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book that is written to do your will, O God. And he goes and repeats this all over again as if it's not clear enough. He goes, Previously saying, Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are according to the law. And then he says, and then, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. Pay attention to this next phrase. It's important. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. What was he talking about? He takes away the old covenant, the sacrificial system, and he replaces it with the blood of Jesus, the, the new blood covenant that we're under now. And I'm so glad that we don't have to sacrifice all these animals up in here today, but Jesus paid for our sins once and for all time. So here's the deal. Because Jesus paid for our sin, there's many people in the church today that, that, that think there's not much point in discussing Old Testament law anymore. There, it, it no longer applies to us. We're no longer under the law. And that's true. We're not. But here's the deal. We should discuss it. We had better discuss it. How else are you ever going to know the depths and the riches and the mercy of what God has done for us until we understand what it all came from? Man, if we don't understand uh, or study the Old Testament, then we miss the purpose, the why behind the what of the law and what it did. And therefore, we miss much of the great story of God. And besides, you know what? Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. Look what he says in Matthew 5, 17. He says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy the law, but fulfill it. When Jesus died on the cross, he said something very profound. He goes, it is finished. He fulfilled everything in the law, every letter of it, okay? So many Christians, again, will think, well, because Jesus did that, he came to fulfill the law, and now we can ignore them. And I disagree with that. I really do, because Jesus raises the standard in the New Testament. Have you ever known that? He takes the Ten Commandments and puts them on steroids for us. You want to see this? Look at Matthew 5, 21, verses 22. Check it out. This was some of the, uh, you know, the old Ten Commandments that God had given. He goes, you have heard that it said to the people long ago, meaning the Ten, Ten Commandments, you shall not murder, but anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is even angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Raising the bar, isn't he? Look at Matthew 5, 27, 28. He goes, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever even looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow, that's, that's tough. That's some strong stuff. He's raising the bar. So it's true, guys. We're no longer under the law. I want to make that very clear. But the principles of the law are absolutely applicable to us today. That's where we need to separate law from principle. You know, wherever the law is renewed in the New Testament, it's absolutely applicable. Are you saying that we should never put the Ten Commandments on the wall? No, I'm not saying that. You better put them up there. Put them up. 
Let them be a reminder that the bar's been raised even higher than what's on that wall. That's what it should remind us of. See, we keep the renewed law, the law of Christ. That's love. That's what Christ did. He came to fulfill. And now we're under the law of Christ, which is even a higher standard. It's the law of love. Not have to do, must do, we better do, but now I get to do. I want to do. Man, look what I get to do for my Savior. I get to serve him. I get to give him a part of my income. The only one of the Ten Commandments is not renewed in the, in the New Testament is the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath. Jesus died, or he rose on a Sunday. That's our now our new day of worship. How do we know that to be sure? How can we be sure of that? Colossians 2, 16 through 17, he says, So let no one judge you now because of Jesus Christ has died. In food or drink, in other words, the dietary restrictions that I talked about earlier, or regarding a festival or new moon, the, the, the feast and festivals that I'm talking about now, or Sabbath. He goes, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is what? Christ. So Jesus took the Ten Commandments again on a whole another level. And here's the here's guy in closing, guys. Here's the here's deal. This is why the Old Testament is so valuable to us. And, and even profitable as New Testament believers because it serves as a reminder that God just wanted his people, the Israelites, to be holy. He just wanted them to be separated. He didn't want them to look like the rest of the world around them. That's what he calls every one of us to do that's saved. He calls us to live a life that's holy. You know what holy means? Set apart, separated taking a stand that I will not live like I'm in the world. i got to live in the world. i got to be in the world, but I'm not going to live like the world. That's what God calls us to, and that's why, that's why he gave them the law. Yeah, there are some laws that are really hard to understand and strange. There's no doubt about that. But the reason, don't forget, the reason why the law was given, because he just simply wanted to, his people to be set apart. He wanted them to be holy, and we need to wake up, church, that's what God calls us to. It's not this flipping thing, oh, I'll may, I'll maybe come to church once or twice a week or whatever and just kind of come and, you know, and, and that's pretty it. No, there's a new standard in town. Now it's love. Now it's I get to, I want to. That's what the law did. It made you constantly aware of a holy, it righteous God. It put this mega watt, mega ton spotlight on the holiness of God. And God is saying, that's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to be like, be holy as I am holy. That's what God calls us to. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, Father, for your word that cleanses us, God. Thank you for your word that serves as a boiler that boils all the sin and the impurities up to the top, Lord. God, may we use your word and these principles in your, in your word, God, to point the sin that's in our lives, God, that so that we can repent and get that out of our lives, God, that so we can say, Lord, I want to be holy, Lord. That's what you called me to be, Father, so would you help me? Lord, that's not an easy thing to do this day and time, God, so we need you to help us. We need you to strengthen us, Father God. Lord, just magnify your Holy Spirit in our life, God. Lord, if you will do that in our hearts and our life, God, we will be eternally grateful, Father. Thank you, Lord. And while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, nobody looking around, man, if you've never had a time when you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, or maybe you've, maybe you've kind of just run from God for a while and you know you're saved, but man, you've been running from him and you just need to rededicate your life. And especially in light of what the scriptures teach us about this 10 day of awe and how we're supposed to examine ourselves. If there's anyone in this building today that would want to receive Jesus Christ as savior or rededicate your life, would you just raise your hand? I'm not going to embarrass you or anything. I promise I won't do that. Any hands at all? kind of hard to see keep them up I can't it's really hard to see with the lies anybody at all Lord thank you for your word again Lord may we take it seriously may we apply it to our lives and may we take it out into the world father and walk like you have commanded us to do father in Jesus name amen thank you guys you guys have a great weekend